friend, it's Brittany here from My Core Floor, and I am here for a special broadcast with Britt. Um, tonight and next Tuesday and next Thursday, all at 7 o'clock Eastern Time, I'm going to be hopping on here to give you guys some pelvic floor information, some tidbits. Tonight we are going to cover what is the pelvic floor, how does it work, and why do we need to be doing so much more than Kegel exercises. Um, on Tuesday, we're going to talk a little bit more about incontinence and pelvic organ prolapse. And then on Thursday next week, we're going to be chatting about pain. So I will kind of post on the page and remind you guys, but um, kind of stay tuned for these special broadcasts. And then next Sunday night, May 31st, mark your calendar at 7 Eastern time. I am going to be doing a live webinar. So during that webinar, we are going to be talking about all of these topics, um, peeing and pain and prolapse. And we are also going to be talking about my core floor and the exercises we do and the things we offer that really can help women to improve any of those symptoms that they might be having. So mark your calendar. Um, when this little live is over, I'm actually going to post the registration for the webinar if anybody's interested. And then during the week, this week and next week, I'll also be posting links for the webinar if you are interested in joining us. But um, let's get started for tonight and let's talk about the pelvic floor. I am going to shoot guys to keep this around 15 minutes. Um, if you have questions as I go along, feel free to shoot them in the comments and I'll try to, at the end, just scroll through and answer any questions you guys might have. Um, I'm going to shoot for 15, but any of you who know me know I like to talk and when I'm talking pelvic floor, I tend to sometimes get on a little bit of a soapbox. So I'm going to, I'm going to really work hard to keep this at 15 minutes. So let's get it started. So what is the pelvic floor? I'm sure it's something you guys have heard or you've read about or if you're moms, you've kind of seen something in magazines about strengthening your pelvic floor, um, Kegel exercises, those types of things. And as a pelvic floor physical therapist, um, that is my focus, is the pelvic floor and working with women who have issues with their pelvic floor not working correctly. So whether that means they're peeing their pants when they don't want to be, whether that means they can't have sex without pain, they can't go to the gynecologist without pain, um, whether they have constipation or irritable bowel that then leads to pain issues. Um, there's a lot of things that we talk about as a pelvic PT with clients and patients related to how the pelvic floor works, what it is. And so I want to kind of give you a little bit of that tonight. So let's start with my model. Okay, this is the pelvis, guys. So if you're looking at the pelvis, looking at the screen, this is the pubic bone, this is the spine in the back, and these are your pelvic bones here. This opening you see on the side is your hip socket, so that's where your femur or your leg comes out of, okay? So there's your orientation. If I tip the pelvis so that you can actually look inside of it, um, what you see is what looks like a soup bowl of muscles. That's your pelvic floor. So that is your support system for your colon, your uterus, your bladder, your rectum. All of your internal organs sit within this cavity and they're actually supported by the pelvic floor muscles. That's your support system, that's your support structure. Okay, there's a muscle that flaps over on the side here that you'll kind of see. I'm kind of poking it in on both sides. And that is actually your hip rotator. So it controls how your hip kind of rotates outward and rotates inward. It's not part of the bowl, but because it sits directly on the side of it, it impacts um, how the pelvic floor is able to function, which means that when I am working with clients and a lot of the things we do with my core floor, we do a lot of focus on hip mobility and what the hips are doing because of that hip rotator um, and how it sits kind of right on top of that pelvic floor. If we then look at the orientation of the pelvic floor related to the pelvis, it attaches to the pubic bone, okay? And that's where your abdominal muscles come down and attach. It's also where your groin muscles come up and attach, which means that your groin and how tight it is can impact the pelvic floor. It also means that any sort of abdominal surgeries, scar tissue, um, abdominal weakness can also influence the pelvic floor because of the fact that they share this common attachment where the pelvic floor attaches, the abdominals attach, groin and adductors are coming up and in into the same region. So all of those things are going to influence or have an influence on your pelvic floor. It also means your pelvic floor can have an influence on all of those things. So it works both ways. If we then look back inside, we see that the pelvic floor attaches to the tailbone, which is right here, and to the sacrum, which are the lowest parts of the spine. So any sort of back or spinal issues can also influence the pelvic floor. Again, vice versa, pelvic floor can also influence back and spine issues. I've actually worked with a lot of clients over the years who came to me 
from other um, coworkers because they initially started PT thinking that they had a problem with their hip or a problem with their back. And it actually ended up being their pelvic floor that was the problem. And they didn't figure it out until all of the traditional, you know, kind of back hip stuff wasn't working. Their pain wasn't being relieved. And it was actually spasm of these pelvic floor muscles pulling on the back and influencing the hip that were actually causing some of their pain. So when we talk even about pelvic pain next Thursday, um, pelvic pain does not just mean vaginal pain. Sometimes it's back pain, sometimes it's hip pain that can actually be caused by pelvic floor spasm or pelvic floor tightness, okay? So what I tell people, based on all these things I just showed you, how the pelvic floor attaches to the tailbone and the sacrum, how it attaches in the front, how it overlaps with the hip rotators, your pelvic floor is influenced by everything in this ring. And so if something in this pelvic ring is not doing the job it needs to, guess what? It's gonna be really hard for your pelvic floor to do what it needs to. And so if we think about things like injuries or trauma to the pelvis or to the hips or to the spine or pain, um, a herniated disc maybe, or a car accident that maybe fractures your pelvis, um, a traumatic delivery that fractures your tailbone, um, any of those traumas will influence anything in this ring and guess what? That can start to lead to having pelvic floor issues, even though it wasn't a direct, necessarily, pelvic floor trauma. So if we take a closer look at the pelvic floor, the next thing I always like to teach people and show people is that there are three major muscle groups that kind of form what we consider the pelvic floor, okay? And so you can see that noted on the model by the dark and light pink color. So this was one muscle here, this is here, and then this darker pink one here. I don't care if you know the names, I just care that you understand how they work because that's what you need to know to have improved pelvic floor function, okay? So the first group here, this darker red group, okay? They have muscle fibers that run, and I'll show you on the model here. That means the muscle fibers and lines that run on the model that run vertical, back and forth. So if I tip the model, so you're kind of looking at it from the other direction, so it's a little brighter to look at on screen. So we're back to, here's your tailbone, here's your pubic bone in the front, okay? We're talking about this first group of muscles here. I actually drew an arrow on the model so that you guys could see. So the fibers actually in that group of muscles runs vertical, so it runs along with the arrow. So what, Britt, who cares? Why do you need to know that? Well, what you need to understand is that because that group of muscles has fibers that run vertical, that means that your pelvis, hips, and spine have to move in that plane of motion to activate that muscle. Hmm, okay, let's break it down and make it simpler because these are hard muscles to understand because you can't see them, okay? So I'm gonna use my bicep because that's a, it's an easy one. If somebody wants to get a strong bicep, let me guess, you guys all know what to do. You grab a weight, you start doing curls, okay? As you curl up, the bicep shortens, okay, or tightens. As you curl down, the bicep lengthens. As you go back and forth repeatedly, it creates this kind of um, accordion effect where it goes out and in and out and in, and that will build up your muscle belly, brings in blood flow, builds up strength and function. If I walk around all day and I just hold the dumbbell like this in a shortened position, guess what? My bicep won't get any stronger. If I walk around all day and I hold my arm out straight like this and I just hold that dumbbell there, my bicep is not gonna get any stronger. That arm has to move back and forth to create that accordion effect to get those fibers to pump and to work so that your bicep gets stronger. Guess what? Pelvic floor works the same way. So because this first group of muscles has fibers that run this way back and forth, your pelvis, hips, and spine have to move that way back and forth in order to activate. Now, pelvic floor muscles make a bowl. So now let's look at the second group of muscles, that lighter pink. So if we're looking at it from the inside here, it's this light pink group. And if I flip it here, just so you guys can get a better shot. These muscles here start going a little bit more lateral. So they kind of run a little sideways. They change direction from that first group of muscles, okay? So what does that mean? That means to get those fibers activated, your pelvis has to move side to side, back and forth this way to get those muscles activated, okay? So now let's look at the third group of muscles that attach back near that tailbone. So if I flip it around, Here's your spine, okay? These ones wrap around kind of on the horizontal, but a little bit differently than that lighter pink group, okay? So this is more lateral. These kind of wrap in more of a rotational or horizontal. So if you were to look at them from this view, they kind of wrap around. And so the significance of them wrapping around means that they actually operate best with rotation because that kind of follows that wrap around of how the fibers orient. So 
Your pelvis has to be able to move well, forward and back, side to side, and rotation. The pelvis isn't isolated though, so that means your spine also has to move well there, means your hips also have to move well there in order to get good activation of all those pelvic floor muscles. Now, you might be saying, well, what's a Kegel exercise? Where does that kind of fall into this mix? Well, the cool thing about the pelvic floor um, is that because it's shaped like a bowl, it actually also activates in a fourth plane of motion, which is unlike any other group of muscles in the body. Most muscles in the body activate in three planes, the ones I just showed you, in some fashion. Some, more plane, some activate more in one plane than another, but usually in some fashion they activate in all three planes. Pelvic floor has a fourth plane, that's vertical. Because you have a bowl that your pelvic floor forms, when you actually go down into a squat or a lunge, the muscles will lengthen, and when you come up out of that squat or lunge, the muscles will contract. That's also a Kegel exercise. A Kegel activates in the vertical plane of motion. So with a Kegel exercise, you're contracting that entire group of muscles, all three of them, and you're lifting them together up, and then you're relaxing them down. Now, I have so many women that come in to see me that are frustrated because they've been doing Kegels. Uh, their doctor has told them to do Kegels. They've read in parenting magazines to do Kegels. Um, they've started to reach menopause and the muscles are starting to atrophy a little bit. And so they've been told to do Kegels. Um, their mothers told them to do Kegels. Their friends told them to do Kegels. And yet the problem is still the same and in some cases even getting worse. And so where does that fall? Well, what I explain to people is that a Kegel exercise is only 25% of how your pelvic floor is working. So if there's four ways to activate your pelvic floor and you're only good at one of them, that means you're only good at 25%. It means that we need to really take a closer look at those other three planes of motion. And what I find is that that's where the limitations are with most of my one-on-one -on -one clients. It's not in that vertical plane. If you think about our day-to-day -day activities, we do a lot of forward and back motion with walking. We do a lot of up and down motion, vertical. We're squatting to pick up laundry, pick up kids, um, pick things up off the floor. We're doing squats and lunges in our workouts. Um, but we don't get a lot of side to side motion and we don't get a lot of true rotation that comes from the pelvis. A lot of us get a lot of rotation that comes from the spine because we're so used to being tight and locked through our pelvis. Um, if you think about um, sports, gymnastics, dance, there's so much emphasis on holding your core and holding it tight. And that is not a bad thing. Having a tight core is not bad, but there has to be a balance like anything else in life. You know, always doing one thing is not always good. There's gotta be a little give and take. And so while it's good to be strong and stable through your pelvis, it's also good to be mobile and flexible through your pelvis. And that's a lot of times where I see the limitation. People are so used to that vice grip of locking up their pelvis and holding everything in tight that they've forgotten how to move it. When you think about little kids, you don't have, most little kids don't start having incontinence issues at the age of eight or nine. It's not typical. There are cases neurologically, but it's not a typical thing. Kids potty train at the age of two and three. Do you ever sit down and show this model to your grandkids or to your daughters or sons or nieces or nephews? Um, have you ever seen the pediatrician pull out this model to explain to your kids how to potty train? No, it'd be crazy. Um, do you ever sit down and teach a kid how to Kegel? Do you ever tell them to stop their urine flow or squeeze and relax, squeeze and relax, hold for 10 seconds, hold for two seconds? No, well why? Because a kid has no problem moving their pelvis in four planes of motion. They are up and down and twisting and turning and dancing and jumping and crawling. What do we not do enough as adults? We do a lot of sitting. We do a lot of bracing. We do a lot of, oh, let's hold everything tight because it'll you know, tighten our core and it'll tighten our abs. We have pain, so we get guarded. We don't wanna move our pelvis because it might hurt. We're afraid of it hurting. We have balance issues as we age, so we're afraid to really let our pelvis move because that feels a little unstable. That feels unsafe. And so more and more as we age and age and age, we start to lock down our pelvis. That's why Kegel exercises are not the end all be all because it, just doing that one squeeze doesn't take into account that whole pelvic ring the spine, the hips, the whole pelvis, and how it moves, how those muscle fibers orient, how they need to move in order to um, get the three planes of motion going. It's so important to really have mobility, not just the strength and stability. stability. And it's so important to go far beyond Kegels. Kegels are 25%. You've gotta be able to move in other directions. And so people will say, well, I run, or I take a walk, or you know, I do do things, I do do workouts. Part of the problem, guys, is a lot of us get really good at compensating. 
So when we start to really lock down through that pelvis, we do rotate and side bend, but it starts a lot of times coming in our knees. It starts coming in our spine. It's why we start getting a lot of knee issues and back pain and back problems um, is that we start getting those motions in places we shouldn't be. So one of the cool things that we're gonna do Sunday night, if you check us out at the webinar, is we're actually gonna teach you how to do a self-movement assessment of your pelvic mobility, how to check your three planes of motion and see how, you know, how your body moves and compare your right side to your left side because it's not all moving as one unit. You know, your right side sometimes will do things better than your left, depending on your dominant or your non-dominant side or your movement patterns or where you've had injuries, ankle sprains, um, and how that changed your gait and your pattern of movement. Um, so we're gonna show you guys on Sunday night how to do some self-assessment stuff. Um, one of the other things we're gonna do on Sunday night is show you three of my favorite pelvic floor exercises. So, um, you know, you guys can get started with some things. If you are not in my free group um, that's off of this My Core Floor page, it's, so, it's titled Calling All Women, um, go ahead and jump in there. Sorry guys, it's for women only, but if you have a woman in your life that might benefit, invite them to join. Um, because every week in there, we're in there and we're showing an exercise of the week, teaching you how to really get this three-dimensional mobility of your pelvis. It's not being talked about anywhere. Um, I literally had conversations with urologists and gynecologists who say, my clients are doing so well with you, what do you do with them? And I had one tell me, we don't get this in school. We don't get the biomechanics. Um, we get the basics of, you know, there's muscles there and, and the basic function, but they don't understand the biomechanics and they don't get enough of it because they're focused on the medications and the surgeries and all the other things that doctors need to do. Um, and so as a PT, this is my specialty, is the biomechanics, how it moves, how the muscles function. So if you're not in my free group, go ahead and jump in there. Um, I'm getting close to 15 minutes and I'm just about done guys. So um, I want you guys to really think about coming next Sunday night to the webinar, learn how to do some self-assessment, learn a few exercises, and we're gonna dive a little deeper on you know, how the pelvic floor works and on some of the dysfunction and how to correct some of the dysfunction. Um, also super exciting, the My Core Floor membership is gonna be opening up um, after the webinar. So if you're interested or you want more information, comment below, or um, you can certainly always reach out to me at Brittany at mycorefloor.com. Um, I hope you guys have an awesome night. I don't see any questions, but hi to everybody that's in the group. Um, super excited that you came to join us. And like I said, Tuesday night at seven, I'll be back here to talk a little bit more about incontinence and prolapse. Um, next Thursday, we'll be talking about pain, and then next Sunday night at seven will be the webinar. So I hope to see you guys there. Um, we'll talk to you all soon. Have a good one. Take care.